That ain't over yet. I'm mad. On today's episode, will DC hit more than miss in its future films? Well, we'll see. I give you an update on Warner Brothers' plans for the DCEU. God, I love cocaine. Also, with the Disney buyout, there's a lot of scheduling changes to the X-Men films at 20th Century Fox this year. I'll give you the latest. And remember, hugs, not drugs. Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. Oscar season is here. I review some of the top nominations for this year's Academy Awards. We shall never surrender! And everyone loves a one-man siege. Worst storm in the castle with this week's movieism. All this and much more in this episode of E-Money's Reviews. back here again with a new episode well it finally happened all of our boys and girls are coming back home to disney with the deal with 20th century fox being official you guys know that but what does that mean for fox's film schedule this year plus all the other big shakeups as a result of the deal i'll have coming up but while disney is taking on the task of merging two franchises warner brothers is dealing with the problem of cleaning up its one franchise both with who's running things behind the scenes and with who's starring in front of the camera so Let's get into it. With the recent shakeup at Warner Brothers still settling, the latest reports have been that the studio will now adopt a fewer cooks in the kitchen approach to their future films in the aftermath of Justice League's disappointing box office return. What this means is that newly appointed chairman Toby Emmerich will no longer have to seek approval by committee and will answer only to CEO Kevin Sujihara. Probably butchered that name. Sujihara himself had this to say about the future of the DCEU. Warner Brothers needs to continue doing what it's always done, producing the biggest, most diverse slate in the business. That's what's made us successful. We can't do what Disney's done. It's worked really, really well for them, but it's not who we are. We need to continue to create a balanced slate of all types of movies and genres. But with all these shakeups, what does this mean for the stars in front of the camera? By now, everyone is probably sick of hearing about the will he, won't he regarding Ben Affleck vacating the role of Batman. Honestly, all these conflicting reports is making my head spin, so I'm just going to sum it up with a quote that was released from a studio rep at Warner Brothers. Hall is probably Batman. Affleck is not out of it yet. That's the thing. He still has a contract. But the studio is sour on him. If he rolls, Jake is in. Kind of a weird web. These guys both know they control each other's destiny. So there's the balancing act right now. Everyone is waiting on somebody else to make a move. The rest of us are just sitting here waiting. But on to some other Warner Brothers news, actress Lindsay Lohan recently continued her campaign to play Batgirl in the Joss Whedon film. But Lohan says that a lot of fans are distracting from her future by dwelling on her past. In a recent interview on the Wendy Williams show, she had this to say. I learned my lessons, but then it distracts from actually maybe meeting with people to do Batgirl, or maybe meeting doing a Mean Girls too. It really distracts people, and then they only think about the negative, and I don't really think that's a way to move forward in life. I gotta say, I'm with a lot of the fans on this one. I mean, I would love to see a Batgirl film directed by Josh Whedon, but if they cast Lohan into the part, I'm afraid that the film would be caught in production limbo all the time because of Lohan's unprofessionalism, which she has a noted track record for. Plus, I'm comparing what I imagine Lohan would do in the part with Alicia Silverstone's god-awful miscasting in Batman and Robin, and the two just seem too similar. I mean, granted, just about everything was wrong with the Batman and Robin movie. I mean, writing, directing, set design, costume design, bat nipples. But Silverstone definitely ranks among the casting problems. But whatever happens, I do hope that Lohan lands some kind of role, whether it's Batgirl, Mean Girls 2, or some other part that gets her career back on track. 
Now on to some DC TV news. If you've been watching Supergirl for the last two seasons like I have, you may have become frustrated with Bonnell's bland or complete lack of costume when he goes out on a mission. Well, now it looks like the CW is about to change that. The CW recently released this image with Monel finally sporting the red and blue suit from the comics. We can only hope that Monel is getting off the sidelines and joining the fight against Rain with Supergirl and the other Legionnaires, which so far he has stayed out of for fear of interfering with Earth's timeline. Should be an exciting next few episodes of Supergirl along with the other CW shows with Black Lightning joining the lineup, and I can't wait for the next big team-up story either. Now on to some Marvel news, boy. Where to start? Okay, first up, with the 20th Century Fox buyout from Disney, this has led to a lot of scheduling changes for the X-Men and the X-Men spinoff films this year. First up, Deadpool 2 will be released slightly ahead of schedule, moving from June 1st to May 18th. This is likely due to Disney's solo, A Star Wars Story, coming out the following weekend, May 25th, which isn't expected to do as well. So, Disney wants to put its most anticipated film out in front. But it's not all good news. It seems that Disney wants to push back the release of the horror-based New Mutants from April 2018 to February 2019 to avoid clashing with other X-Men and Marvel films at the box office. Then there's the really bad news. Poor Gambit. Just poor, poor Gambit. He just cannot seem to find his way out of pre-production hell. After director Gore Verbinski walked away from the project after a number of scheduling conflicts, the film has now been pulled from the studio schedule. Channing Tatum is still attached to the project, but it's unclear now when filming will begin. Right now, the best estimate is summer of this year. In other news regarding the Disney Fox deal, could Wolverine be the first X-Men to cross over into the MCU? Well, if Hugh Jackman has his way, that could be the case. Now, as we all know, Logan is supposed to be Hugh Jackman's final portrayal as the character, but with the Disney Fox deal happening, he may be rethinking that position. At a recent panel at Ace Comic Con in Glendale, California, the Winter Soldier, Sebastian Stan, had this to say about a recent encounter with Jackman. Be set. I, recently, I happened to be sitting next to Hugh Jackman at this... Wow, all right, here we go. So... Wow. I, I didn't God know damn. what other awkward thing I could talk about, but to be like... Am I gonna see you soon? I, I don't know. And um, but uh, he said a couple things to me, and I'll just I'll just leave it at that because I feel like otherwise I'm gonna get in, get into trouble with somebody. But you know, you just you like just... lit things. Like, <laughs> I know. So think about what are you that. Doing? No, but but he, you know, I asked him because I, I kept thinking I was like he he said whether or not that was Logan was supposed to be the last Wolverine thing or whatever, and and it's you know he said to me what he's I think he publicly said out there, which was like. He's he's been thinking about it and he you know it's on his mind so I don't know he may be <laughs> oh Sebastian oh. I think Sebastian I think uh, phones off please please uh, can you rewind the last 15 seconds right <laughs> so there it is personally if I were an executive at Disney and I heard that Hugh Jackman was even slightly interested in playing the part again I would be jumping all over those negotiation deals. Now on to some other Marvel news, for the last few months there's been a bit of confusion about where the upcoming Venom film will fall into the MCU. Mostly it's been said that it will follow the same universe as Spider-Man Homecoming, which is a part of the larger MCU, but that Spider-Man himself won't appear. Well, now it seems that's no longer the case. Movie insider John Schnepp recently appeared on an episode of Collider Movie Talk and had this to say about Spider-Man star Tom Holland's involvement in Venom. I'm going to say it right here on this show. Spider-Man is going to be in Venom. Ooh, what? All right. What? So like, <laughs> let's look at it this way. You know, like for the last couple of months, well, we've been talking about Venom. We've been hearing about how, you know, Sony's keeping it all separated. And Spider-Man's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But every other character that's in the Spider-Man universe is separate. Like a cameo? Like a cameo, like a who knows a what a yo. Um, all I'm saying is, uh, hey, man, Spider-Man, and I'm talking about Tom Holland's Spider-Man is going to be in Venom. Okay. So bigger involvement, a stronger connection to the MCU as a whole. And I've just read that principal photography on Venom has just wrapped. So it's still on track to be released on October 5th of this year. Now in a final bit of Marvel news, we're getting some of our first images of Brie Larson as Captain Marvel in the upcoming film of the same name. In this image taken from the set, you see Larson sporting a black and green suit, which is a bit removed from the more comic accurate blue and red suit. 
Now, of course, Captain Marvel has sported the green suit in the comics before, but this is the first time that I know of that the female version has done so. But in any case, Brie Larson looks great, and Captain Marvel is set to be released in March of next year. Now on to some other entertainment news, we're getting some new details concerning the new John Wick spinoff series, The Continental. Reeves is expected to executive produce and will reprise his role as John Wick, but only in a guest star capacity. Star CEO Chris Albrecht had this to say about the upcoming series. The Continental promises to include the thunderous fight sequences and intensely staged shootouts between professional assassins and their targets that fans have come to expect in the John Wick movie franchise, as well as introduce some new, darkly compelling characters who inhabit this underground world. Now, if you're wondering about fan favorites Lance Reddick and Ian McShane, well, at this time it's unclear whether or not they'll reprise their roles for the series. And finally, new details have been released concerning the fifth installment in the Indiana Jones franchise. While Steven Spielberg is set to direct, and Harrison Ford will return as the iconic archaeologist, we now know when production will begin. With his highly anticipated Ready Player One due out later this year, Spielberg has stated that his next big projects will be the West Side Story remake and Indiana Jones 5. Spielberg hopes to begin filming in 2019 with a release date of summer 2020 planned. Details on the story are scarce right now, but it has been confirmed that Shia LaBeouf will not reprise his role as Indy's son, Mutt Williams. Okay, that does it for entertainment news. Now we're moving on to this week's movie reviews. Reviews, plural. As you guys know, Oscar season is here. It's one of my favorite times of the year. I got my ballot all printed out here. And as you may be able to tell, I've seen most of the films in the big six categories. The four acting categories, directing, and best picture. Now, I plan on having the entire Big Six knocked out before Oscar night on March 4th. But for now, because there are so many films on the ballot here in the Big Six, I am going to divide up my reviews between this episode and my next episode, which I'll have out before March 4th. So, let's get into it. First up, The Greatest Showman. Yeah, I know it was only nominated for Best Original Song this year. But of all the films on the ballot, I think this one is probably on my top three most enjoyable films. I think it was pretty well snubbed by the Academy, as it should have been nominated for costume design, production design, and possibly even Best Actor and Best Picture. Who else but Hugh Jackman could have done this role? When I saw the first trailer to this movie, the first thing I thought was, that is just Hugh Jackman doing what he loves to do. No one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. It's a great feel-good story, amazing songs, great performances by the ensemble cast, and that's why I give it three and a half popcorns out of four. Next up, Call Me By Your Name. <sighs> I hated this movie. I just went to see it to scratch it off the ballot, really. It's not that I hated it for the subject matter or anything, it was just really boring. On a side note, the mom and dad in this film you are terrible parents. A guy in his 30s is taking advantage of your 17-year-old son, practically right in front of you, and you're almost encouraging him. Boring movie, but just the type of thing that the Academy eats up. This amateur critic, however, hopes that it doesn't win anything, and I give it one popcorn out of four. Next up, Darkest Hour. Ooh. This one I am pretty confident is going to take home a few statues likely in hair and makeup, and possibly even Best Actor. Gary Oldman gives an amazing and almost unrecognizable performance as Winston Churchill as he leads Great Britain in one of the greatest crises in the early days of World War II. You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Nonsense. The only slippery slope. Would you stop interrupting me while I am interrupting you? Inspiring stuff, and that's why I give Darkest Hour three popcorns out of four. Next up, Dunkirk. This film is practically a companion piece to Darkest Hour, as Darkest Hour shows the crisis from Winston Churchill's point of view, and Dunkirk shows it from the soldiers fighting on the ground's point of view. This one, while not a terrible movie, I thought was just a bit slow for a war film. Also, with the exception of one pilot, I think, you never actually see a Nazi, which I thought was a bit strange. Also, spoiler alert, when the civilian fleet finally arrives to rescue the soldiers, I feel like their entrance could have been a bit grander. Like a little more emotional for the viewer. I just don't think I was getting the feels that it should have invoked in me for that scene. 
So that, with a few other minor issues I had with the film, I'm going to give this one two and a half popcorns out of four. Next up, Guillermo del Toro's romantic sci-fi drama, The Shape of Water. Now, in case you were wondering, despite being made by the same guy and the same actor, no, this is not a prequel to Hellboy's Abraham Sapien character. This film has a lot of stuff going for it. It's a period piece, it's got amazing performances, it's an odd romance, pretty much the ultimate Oscar bait. Also, a pretty great villain that you love to hate throughout the film. This one should definitely take home some technical awards, and it's on my shortlist for Best Actress. That's why I give it three popcorns out of four. But for her to take home the gold, she's going to have to beat the leading lady in my last film today, and that's three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. This film tells the story of a mother's struggle to get justice for the rape and murder of her daughter when the investigation runs dry. This film has a star-studded cast, which is why it took home the SAG Award for Best Ensemble, obviously a lot of drama, and just enough action to hold your attention. The ending, however, I found to be just a little unsatisfactory, which is what kept it from getting a higher score from me, and I'm giving it two and a half popcorns out of four. Okay, that does it for movie reviews this week. Be sure to tune into my next episode where I'll give you the rest of my Oscar nominated reviews. Now, on to this week's movieism, and this is one I like to call. Bye bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle! Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye bye! Bye! This is something you see in so many movies, usually in the final fight scene, where the main protagonist is just revved up and he's ready to take the fight to the bad guys, and then he just lays siege to their base or their castle or hideout or whatever, and he just lays waste to everyone in his path. just about does it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more content. Also, be sure to like Frackin' Nerds over at Facebook. They got a lot of fun stuff over at Frackin' Nerds. A lot of great podcasts. They have the Frackin' Nerds show, of course. And then the Simply Drunk Booze News. They've got Controller Girls. A lot of great stuff over at Frackin' Nerds. I'm Eric E. Money Seavers. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some storming of my own to do.